It's nighttime. I'm loving it. It's coming closer to summer. I mean, I spent the entire day today working on tomato plants and tulips bulbs that are already this tall and they're beginning to bloom. And I have my containers that I'm moving around and I'm kind of excited. It's like, wow, it's happening. <laughs> Everything that God said that we could do, we're doing. And it's working, which is always amazing. Video and the good news according to the kingdom of God that we do as a regular set when we're trying to explain things or trying to teach about what God has said. It's gotten together to do a new segment that's going to be a regular series that, as you probably know in looking at Vidivo, we have Vidivo Today, which has two morning devotionals, and then there's Vidivo Meditations that have kind of like a produced intro and exit. There's, oh, I don't know, religiosity, and there's you know, all kinds of news services and things going on that's kind of exciting, you know, that we've been a part of because God has opened up doors for such a time as this because we know we're in the last years. We know we're in the last days and we know we are the last generation. So because of that, some of us have waited a lifetime for this moment to come upon us when God would kind of like release us to go into the ministry and to do the things that we've always been wanting to do to proclaim the kingdom of heaven is at hand that Jesus is coming again and he's coming soon now I am the one who says no not in 2012 but starting from 2013 onward ooh boy does it get exciting I mean it starts wrapping things up you know and getting things moving along in a very quick pace and things start going exponentially so I'm kind of excited, you know, because also we've been doing in Vidivo getting all of this material ready and posted and these websites getting together and putting it together and getting it behind the scenes kind of ready to explode outward because I'm not so interested in people that are already saved because, yes, I'm helping disciple them and teach them and inspire them, you know, to go out and do the things that God already said we should be doing anyways, but... You know, if I can help them in some way to know Jesus in a more personal, intimate way, then, yeah, I'm thrilled about that. But there's other things, too, that I've realized and recognized in the body of Christ that sometimes doesn't really get talked about much because sometimes we specialize, you know, like we focus in on this or that or the other thing. You know what I mean. Like, okay, you could have like a Pentecostal who's, oh, wow, you know, they're all into speaking in tongues. You know, that's their whole idea of prayer. Or you could have someone else over here that their whole idea of prayer is beads, you know, rosary. Praying the rosary, saying the Our Fathers and Hail Marys. Oh, but then you could come over here and, you know, you got the Jews. Oh, they're tying on the little boxes, you know, doing the tefillin, laying tefillin, you know, and praying the you know, and doing all the good stuff, you know, and kind of like, you know, making, you know, paying for this and doing this, downing this way and downing that way, kind of to the left, to the right, and back up three steps, you know praying for hours, or like the Greek Orthodox said, pray for a long time, or, my gosh, have you ever seen a Muslim pray? Man, they get down on their face, you know? Well, Jews do too, but, you know, it's just kind of an Eastern thing that you really don't know unless you've been there. Well, I don't know about you, but me, I kind of always got myself into trouble because, you know what I would do, is that, first of all, I would get my glasses all so dirty that I couldn't see through them, <laughs> but besides that, what I would do is that whenever I didn't understand something, you know, like I would hear somebody say, well, there's intercessory prayer. I'd go, oh, really? Okay. What's that? You know, and I'd read up on everything I could find about it. Or they'd say there's petitioning prayer. I'd go, oh, really? Okay. You know, and I'd read up on that. Or there's public prayer. And I'd go, public prayer? I thought Jesus said do it in secret. You know, and I'd read up on that. Or there's like men's prayer watch, you know, and I got involved in that, you know, and I said, wow, that's cool. Then, like, in synagogue, you know, I went to synagogue, and I saw all this formalized prayer, you know, like, you stand up, you sit down, you sit down, you stand up, you know, you kind of say this, you say that, the Shimon Esrei, and do all these things, you know, Amidah, you know, ooh, it was cool, you know, you put on your, you put on your prayer shawl, you know, it was like, wow, you felt holy, sort of. So I always kind of wondered about all this, because, you see, what I would do is... I always thought prayer was conversation, you know, like having a two-way conversation with God. So 
I kind of figured that prayer was always about talking to God and God talking to you. And then I found out, according to church and the body of Christ, it's really not. You see, because they've been going out and throwing things out there like, you know, the prayer of faith or the prayer of healing or the prayer of this or the prayer of that. And I'm like, well, did God answer? Well, yeah, he did. He healed. But but did he speak? Well, no. Oh. oh. Well, I thought, you know, like, you know, it kind of went hand in hand that you were talking to God and God was talking to you and then he had healed. No. So you see, I found that there was a lot of people that were like saying all kinds of things about what they either called prayer or interpreted prayer or kind of like just used the word prayer to cover all kinds of things that I couldn't figure out what they're talking about. I was lost. So I would get involved. I'd go out and I'd say, hey, you know, you, you got men's prayer watch? Good. I want to come out and volunteer, you know. And they only let me pray like once a week, you know, and I wanted to go every night of the week. <laughs> I thought it'd be cool. So, you know, we did our thing, you know, we had these prayer lists, you know. And I'm like, cool, you know, because the prayers that come in from the church, you know, they secretaries would put these little short blips on, you know, and then we were told to, you know, like pray and God would inspire us with the words to say. So I would pray and sure enough God inspired me and I thought, well that was cool. And then there were times where, you know, I remember getting involved like with messianic women at times where they kind of like did all these weird things, you know, and I kind of went, ooh, well, that's, I'll give it a shot, you know. Then I remember the charismatic movement, I got involved with them, and I, I noticed that they were doing all kinds of strange things too about prayer, you know, I went, well, that's kind of interesting. So every time that I got involved in something different like that, I'd go back and ask God about it, you know, like, Father, what is this? You know, what, what's going on with all this stuff, you know? Do I really have to, you know, tie the knots, you know, and wrap it around my fingers, you know, and remind myself what's going on? Do I have to pray according to a scripture and make sure that the scripture is in it, you know? Or do I have to pray because somebody told me to pray for them and I have to pray what they want even though I know it's wrong? So, I learned a lot the hard way because, you know, I kind of went... Well, God showed me, and He did. So, <laughs> because He did it, I kind of got a lot to talk about. I'm kind of excited about sharing it. And so we decided to start, the Lord and I, you know, and we decided to share about pray. That simple. Just pray. You know, the subject, pray. About, like, you know, praying for the President of the United States. Because people tell me they can't do that, you see. They tell me that, oh, well, he's he's a Muslim. And I went, really? That's not what I heard. Or they'll tell me, like, he's not a Christian. I go, really? I thought he went to church, you know. And they'll say, well, you can't pray for him because that, that that's not what we do. We want him eliminated. And I'm like, really? Man, it doesn't sound like what David did, you know. So I'm kind of like, got confused about that part. So we're going to talk about that one of those favorite subjects that people don't want to talk about. Or like praying for your enemies, you know, or praying for those that despitefully use you and confuse you and, you know, like really abuse you. What would you pray for them? God, kill them. Yeah, well, David did, didn't he? So, starting a new series is always kind of fun because I like to do this overview and I like to look out on the vistas of the horizon, you know, and see all that God might do and allowing me to share, you know, some of the experiences that I've gone through, you know, like in Jerusalem when we prayed, you know, or like when I met this group that they called themselves the School of Prophets, you know, and how they were like, I don't know if it was Jerusalem Syndrome or what it was, but apparently some Calvary pastors came from these groups, you know, and I went, wow, you know, that's kind of different, you know, and some of the things they did, and we're going to pray about that and share about how God can use that Maybe in a little way, maybe, you know, has a lot of kind of strange stuff, but maybe in a little way they're kind of like hidden a certain way so that God could use them today after they've gotten out of some of the stuff they were in, you know. Because after all, some of the men that I know that came out of that are pretty dynamic pastors right now, you know. They're teaching some pretty good word, you know, and I'm going, see, God can use anything, by golly. 
or like, you know, prayers kind of like when Elisha was praying, you know, he kind of just said, God, open up your eyes, you know, see this. And I'm kind of like, man, that sounds like belligerence to me. So I always was interested in how people pray and always talk to people about, you know, praying out loud and they would say, no, I don't do I don't like to do that. Or they'd say something to me like, you know, when I would be conned into talking out loud or praying out loud and sure enough, you know, I mean, they'd say, oh, you have such a beautiful prayer. And I'd be going, Lord, it's a pharisaical prayer. Why do they like it? And then God finally had to take me to a place alone, kind of like out in a desert place where I had to have kind of like this intervention, you know. I mean, you know what an intervention is, where all your friends get together and tell you what's wrong. When God gives you an intervention, ooh, he didn't just tell you what's wrong, he tells you what's right. And so, God took me in a quiet place, you know, to give me an intervention, you know, with him. And so, he showed me, like, you know, just through the word and through talking to him, you know, just, here's what it is, here's where it comes from, here's what they do, here's why, and here's how you go. And I'm like... Ah, so that's it. Okay. Only, I always took it in, and I never really told people much about it. Or I'd say something like, well, no, you know, don't pick on them, they're just doing this, you know. And people would go, wow, where'd you learn that? And I said, I went and asked them. I didn't know that was wrong. I thought maybe when you want to know something about somebody, like, why do you do the way you pray? You know, why do you pray the way you do? You know, they usually tell you, you know, and they explain it to you. And so... I would go ask them, maybe even live with them for a while, you know, and kind of learn what they're doing, you know, and then kind of go, well, Lord, what do you think, you know, and ask him what he wanted for me. Personally, kind of the best time I have is laying, pardon me, stark naked back in a bathtub looking up at the ceiling, you know, and God talking to me <laughs> in a tub of hot water. Man, I just think that's the greatest time in the world. <laughs> A lot more holy for me sometimes than worshiping, you know, and having your hands extended and just, ah, you know, and all that stuff. Because I've been there too, you know, and I've had that marvelous experiences of the blessings of the Holy Spirit, you know, and the gifts of the Spirit, words of knowledge, and words of wisdom, and this going around and that going around, all this happening all at the same time, and people doing, you know, incorporating interpretation of tongues and a prophecy and a word, you know, this, and then having to, you know, explain to people what it is going on in the time that it is, because sometimes they get carried away. So, I'm hoping maybe if we talk about pray if we talk about the good that there is in talking to God and with each other then maybe you won't feel so antagonistic to somebody else who does it a different way than you do maybe you won't feel so challenged if someone says well you know I'm doing Lent and you go Lent? Ew, what's that? Yeah. But you kind of get into it and you find sincere people that are in it that really have a heart for God. And they, you discover they're born again too. And they do Lent. Am I missing out on something? I think Paul said that, you know, for conscience sake, people can do what they really want to do because their conscience kind of leads them. And that consciousness, hopefully, is led by a spiritual consciousness, which is the Holy Spirit, determining for every person to do as He leads them. So I think you're beginning to get a handle on what I mean by what we want to do in this big topic of pray. Because I could sit here and tell you everything that's wrong with people. But you know what? I want to be one of the few even if I'm the only one that might tell you what's right with what God is doing with people. I want to share with you the good news of how He can use all kinds of people in lots of different settings and how it really is amazing how much our Father in Heaven uses even our stumblings and bumblings around in the Scriptures to pray as we ought to. Because I would rather you pray than to just say you do and not do it. You know, I was reading this and it says, When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. 
Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. But you, when you pray, enter into your closet, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father which is in secret, and your Father which seeth in secret shall reward you openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for the much speaking. I got to thinking about that, you know, and I remember as a born again Christian in the early days, I went into a closet and I closed the door and I prayed. <laughs> really, I did. I, I had this little closet, you know, and it wasn't a prayer closet, it was a closet. And so I moved my clothes over and I said, I'm going to pray in here. So I got down, my, I didn't T-bowl, you know, like in front of everybody, you know, and receive a reward from all the accolades that people said, you know. And, speaking opportunities and ministry that goes along with being seen by people for what you're doing. But I kind of like, I went in this closet, you know, it was like 1970, oh, probably six. And I went in this closet, you know, and I said, Lord, you know, I, I want to get a handle on this. You really want me to go in a closet? You know, and so I opened the closet. I went in there. I got down on my knees. My knees hurt, so I put a pillow down. And then I start praying. You know, and I was praying. You know, all these things, you know, and I was trying to remember everything that I wanted to pray, and I was trying to remember what Jesus said, and then I tried not to pray too long because I realized being repetition, I tried to pray too short, and I realized that, you know, like I was studying from navigators at the time, and they kind of said that you ought to pray for, you know, like the president and all these other people. So I started thinking, oh man, I was going on and on, you know, and remembering and trying to remember all the things that I should pray about and all the things that I should do and all the things I wanted to do and how I really wanted to be so sincere. And you know, the funny thing was, was that when I woke up in the morning, I realized I fell asleep in that stupid closet. <laughs> True story. I was in this little tiny closet, sound asleep, with my head against the wall, my knees on the pillow, and I'm like slumped over. <laughs> That's dumb. <laughs> I'm sure God loved it. But I tried it. I tried prayer closets, you know, and I thought, well, that's kind of cool. Then I read this crazy thing by Spurgeon, you know, and he said you should build an altar in your home, so I built an altar in my home. Yeah, I kind of put my, my Bible here, and I had my little lamps here, you know, I had little candles, you know, and all these things, you know, it kind of looked like, you know, a little, it didn't look like Catholic or Protestant or Lutheran or anything, it didn't look like, you know, church, but it was my little idol thing, you know, I mean, not idol, but my little altered thing where I kind of went, yeah, you know, that reminds me. It's kind of like a, a remembrance. It caused me to remember to pray and remembered me to focus in on God. So, like, when I walked by it, I kind of went, oh, okay. Kind of like this bookcase, you know, I kind of use it for a lot of varieties of things, you know. It reminds me to read. Now, go ahead, ask me last time I pulled some of these out. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. I either will surprise you or I'll embarrass myself. One of the two, and I'm not sure which one you're going to find out. Now that I look down there. But the interesting thing about sharing and what we're going to do and pray is that we're not going to stick with just the things that you know about. We're going to talk about things you don't know about. Because, you see, I find that there are pastors and elders, you know, and good Bible scholars who are willing to tell you about certain parts of studying the scriptures. You know, like Jesus saying, don't pray in public, you know, and then he turns around and prays in public, you know, about every chance you get. You know, he's saying, well, Father, I know that you hear me, but for the sake of the people, I'm praying out loud. So, on the one hand, he was teaching that you shouldn't pray out loud, you know, but then on the other hand, he, he did it. And you know as well as I do that everybody prays out loud in front of a camera, in front of the TV, at football games, you know, in Congress. And matter of fact, they're pushing this thing in school, you know, you got to be obvious about prayer, you know, because after all, that's the Christian thing to do. Never mind what Jesus said, but it's a Christian thing to pray in school because we want to make sure that everybody can see us praying. Are you beginning to get the point? This is the most abused, confused word right now in the Christian lingo. I am more than persuaded that 90% of the people that I'm sharing with and that are going to be shared with in the future from these videos 
are going to find and discover parts of the prayer or intercommunication system and perspective that they have and didn't know they could have with God that they never realized goes on when you pray. And that there should be this development of a continual life of prayer as you go forward. Not a continual life of saying grace over a meal or praying after a football game or before one or praying in school but something more than that that involves something different in every given situation which might be led by the Holy Spirit but also might be more formalized in what we call the balance between religion and relationship because you see there's nothing wrong with religion there never has been it's a question of if you have a relationship in the religion because whatever religion it is, if the religion says you should have a relationship with God, then it's a vain religion if you don't have a relationship in it. If you have a personal relationship with Jesus in religion, you are wonderful because you get to apply all this stuff to your life and make it go forward in a very profound way, step by step, moving forward, kind of like, you know, climbing up a ladder, you know, you kind of go one step out after the other, and you have all your tools in your tool backpack because you have religion, you know, you have all these tools and you're available to learn, and you know how to apply that. But the thing that I wanted to bring out about how sometimes pastors don't get into different topics about prayer is just how confusing it gets because, again, you'll have Spurgeon saying prayers, you know, and are like, is like, you know, claiming the promises of God, and you get into this the claiming prayer, you know, where you claim God's promises as though, you know, it were like, you know, taking a check and writing your name on it, you know, and all these analogies you've heard that kind of like, you know, does it kind of get confusing to you? Because for me, I hear all that, you know, like I read Murray, you know, and I've read, you know, Ian Bounds and all these other guys, you know, they always sound good, you know, you know. Religiously, I mean, it sounds pretty intellectual. Philosophically, it sounds pretty cool. Now, does it sound like a rabbi, you know, like in Jerusalem, or does it sound like kind of a Christian over here, you know, and from his sect? And I'm kind of like, you know, when you get kind of like a balance of all these different guys talking about prayer, you kind of go, are we sure we're talking about the same topic? Which is why we're going to break it down. It's not going to just be prayer or pray and all that stuff. We'll have on each one, you know, the mentioning what the topic is so you can watch it and get a handle on it. Because Jesus, when he was talking in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, was talking about a specific circumstance that we should be doing personally. If you want to pray out loud in front of people, just know that, yes, you will be used by God. But you already have your reward. That's all Jesus is saying about it. He isn't saying, don't do it. He's saying, in reality, if you're doing it to be seen of men, that's wrong. If you're doing it to be seen, you know, whatever, it's wrong. But no matter how you're doing it, I want to tell you, because you've been seen, literally, you got your reward. Because people are going to build you up, and they're going to use you, and they're going to, you know, like, you are over it. And it really doesn't count for much, you know, in the kingdom of God. The process and the purpose of an interpersonal communication with our Heavenly Father in a functionary role really amounts to the time that you spend not seeing as opposed to the time you spend being seen. So you see, a lot of times when people think that you know pastors get all these great rewards when they get to heaven, Chuck Smith was one of the first ones told me, hey, you know what, I'm not getting much because I'm seen by, you know, everybody, you know, it's like, no, you guys that are doing all the things behind the scenes, you're going to get more. So I used to work behind the scenes thinking, oh man, I want to rack up everything I can get in heaven, you know, I want to get, I want to I get a lot of bounty, you know. And it's funny because lately, you don't see that teaching as much, do you? You know, do things in secret, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. More often than not, you hear people say, hey, I want to put my name on it, you know. Or then somebody else will come along and say, hey, you're taking glory from God. Well, no, not really, because if you're obvious, like I am on a video series, like Video, you have to put your name on it because, frankly, somebody's got to be held accountable for them. <laughs> Mine is. So you got to take everything in balance, like prayer, like the scriptures, 
like the specifics of when something is being said, like when Jesus is talking about what the Pharisees were doing. And I don't mean just the Pharisees. I mean today he's speaking to us about what is recommended as opposed to what is not recommended. And then sometimes where if you read later on when Paul was praying or Jesus was praying, how they didn't contradict themselves in their own teaching. They were using a specific set of circumstances to get a point across. And that's what we're going to see when we discuss the subject. Because one thing we'll do also is I want to, and I'm asking God about, how to address this you know, huge subject that churches have about prayer chains. You know, to me, a prayer chain is completely off the wall. You know, I've never heard of it. I think it's wrong. But, you know, God says, hey, you know, it gets people involved in seeking Him. So I'm like, well, all right. But, you know, you, you, you know, there's no chains, Lord. And He goes, yeah, I know. But, you know, you got to kind of like think of it as bound. Like when they lay to fill and they say they bind themselves to God's holy call, you know. I was going, well, Lord, yeah, okay. So then the prayer chain is kind of like, Christians trying to bind themselves to some function? I said, God, that doesn't sound like freedom to me. He says, Michael, 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 <laughs> you're missing the point. And so that's how we're going to share about prayer. We're going to tackle those subjects you don't want to talk about, like prayer chains or prayer requests or obvious prayers on the web and, you know, Facebooks and all that kind of junk where you get way over the top people praying, you know, God, I claim it in the name of Jesus, you know, or whatever it may be. We'll talk about name and claim it, you know, and how that part of it, for those people who don't have faith, need to assert themselves in faith for that. It's not because it works. It's because God is at work in them, both to do and to will of his good pleasure. So he works on them, but they have the reward. You know, they have received all that they're going to get from it. So you'll see that as we begin to examine it in the Word of God, but also as we begin to examine it in our hearts, from our mouth, from the very lips that we speak. Because God will give the words that are pleasing you know, in the ears of those who are listening when we are arranging the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart to be pleasing in His sight as we offer up to Him our spoken word to be the communication of prayer to him. There is a blessing yet for you to learn about praying, to learn about how to pray, to learn about praying. Because if we will, we can change everything that's going on around us if we will. Daniel himself was obvious by the set times he put aside in order to pray. And you could say he was a Muslim if you wanted to. Or he was Muslim-like in the certain set times that he prayed. Are you so obvious today in the same way? No. You're not. Because someone in Islam will literally stop their work in the middle of it, lay out their prayer carpet, so to speak, and pray. And they'll bow towards Mecca, you know, and I don't think that I would be wrong in saying that, you know, you could make it into kind of a fun thing by Tebowing, you know, towards heaven, you know, so that you could fulfill the promise that, you know, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, and then be done. You know, you could do that as a repetitious thing but you know once you start getting into the repetitious part you have to question your heart whether or not it's vain or a game or whether you're really doing it in love and joy because some of it's good kind of like this you know what this is the universal symbol for prayer it's interesting that that's a universal symbol for prayer because it only came about like this from literally organized religion church meaning that probably Catholicism or pre-papacy Catholicism, where the clasping of the hands together in prayer actually is taken from this one famous sculpture. But the point is, is that this is a universal sign for prayer nowadays. This isn't. This isn't, you know. This isn't. 
they are considered as expressions of reverence or genuflection, but they're not considered the universal symbol for prayer. Interesting, isn't it? This is. We'll be discussing all of the historical ramifications of prayer in different videos and topics. Because we don't want to make it long like this intro is, but we want to make it fun to kind of check out what's going on that God has been doing all along with those who are seeking to know Him and to hear His voice. Because I'll guarantee you, once you hear His voice and He starts talking to you, He'll rearrange the way you pray. Amen.